Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is February 23rd of 2018. This is going to be one of my rambling videos. I'm going to probably throw in, I'll uh, probably jump around from subject to subject. I apologize for that. That's just just the way, I've at, just the way I am, the way I, I do it. And uh, I've had some people say, Jim, you should do videos on such and such. It'd get a lot of views. You should do videos on this. But uh, I'm not really trying to get... I mean, I'd be happy. I mean, I've almost got 2,500 subscribers. I would like to have 2,500 subscribers. I'd like to have 10,000. I'd like to have a million. Uh, and I would like to be popular. Uh, on YouTube, but I'm not going to do something I'm not interested in. I'm not going to do uh, smash things. I'm not going to, I don't know, dump water on people or I don't know, all the stuff that one woman, uh, very popular, I guess, uh, made, she smashed a, of course it might have been a broken, and but she smashed a new uh, iPad computer in one video. In another video, she filled the bathtub with uh, milk and she had on a swimsuit and she got into the bathtub and she poured a cereal into the bathtub and then she ate it out of the bathtub while she was sitting in it. And she gets a lot of views and there's a lot of people that like her and I'm not interested in watching any videos like that and I certainly am not interested in making any videos like that so um, before the World Wide Web I was making videos and blogging I was started blogging in 1982 um, if you go back before 1982 you go back into the 1950s or 60s or whatever, I was doing a radio program that was broadcast around the world over shortwave radio. I was putting out a uh, monthly publication. It only went out to, you know, 500 subscribers, but it was also exchanged with other clubs and organizations, or whatever, and they, you know, passed on information uh from it um and over that time let's see back back then uh there was a amateur radio club organization or whatever called the certificate hunters club and i did a editorial about the the club or their publication or something and the guy who put it out uh, posted a editorial on his site, uh, or in his we didn't have wasn't that what in site it was a you know magazine or bulletin board type thing. My five hundred page one was mimeographed off. It took me a month to <laughs> mimeograph it off and send it. You know I'd finish sending off. It was a thirty two page publication. 16 sheets of paper, both sides. and uh, But anyway, it took me a month to get it out, then it was time to start another one. Um, that's before personal computers, and I dreamed about things like that, you know, easier way to, you know, why couldn't, uh, why wouldn't this be so, you know, why is this so hard? Anyway, the guy who had the Certificate Hunters Club uh, called me a dirty garbage pail editorializer. And uh, so when I sent out my next bulletin to the subscribers, I printed a certificate inside and a uh, place for them to, for the person who received it to fill, fill in the name, making everybody that uh, subscribed a denizen of the garbage pail. And uh, so I've had a long history of doing things 
Uh, and this is sort of this is sort of what I do. I've had people, and they're correct. I've had people that uh, uh, let's see. Whoops! I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this. I've had people that uh, say, you know, you talk too slow, which is correct. I've had people that say you repeat yourself. That's correct. And other things like that. And that's just me, Jim Howard. That's the way I do things. I do talk slow. I do repeat myself, especially if I'm trying to get some point across. So, uh, I got, and I get sidetracked. Oh, that's, now that's something I would like to correct. Um, I wish I could. I'll start out talking about nuclear war, and then I'll be talking about how to uh, raise uh, guppies or discus or um, something. You know, I just get sidetracked. So this is a thing I know I'm going to get sidetracked on. I'm not sure. I don't. That's something I could do too. Is and I should have make a list. You know, I could pop it up on the screen over here and uh, oh that reminds me there was something yeah um, where would I show that I guess the uh, the store where is the well anyway it's uh, Age of Empires I used to play that I play now Civilization 5 and Civilization 6 I like Civilization V better, but when I'm using my configurations of monitors here, uh, Civilization, the way I have it set up now, and I may change it, I change, that's another thing, I move stuff around it here and hook up monitors, move them around, do things. Civilization V now does not want to show up because of the monitor configuration I have. And I can't send it to the 1080, you know, 1920 by 1080 over here. I could, and I was playing it. So now I've had to go back to Civilization VI, because it'll load on either one. And uh, But anyway, the new, or the redone 4K, I don't have a 4K monitor though, of Age of Empires is out. It's been... Uh, they put a lot of work into the audio and the the graphics, and I really liked Age of Empires. It's what got me hooked into computer gaming. I played Age of Empires. I'm not sure what packages I upgraded with it or whatever, but uh, and it's only twenty dollars, so I'll order it probably. I see that Amazon says they're out of it. But I wouldn't get it from Amazon anyway. I would get it from, uh, well, I'd get it in the, I'll get this in the uh, Windows Play Store. So, uh, okay, I want, I'm glad I, that that jogged my memory. I wanted to mention that, uh, you may, I mean, that's a good price for it, and I'm sure it's going to be great. It was a great game back years ago, and I'm sure it'll be a great game with the, graphic improvements and what have you. By the way, I'm not monetizing this video because I'm going to be talking about the shooting in Florida a little bit, I think, if I don't get sidetracked to talking about uh, the rocket that's on the way to Mars or something. You never know. My mother had Alzheimer's. I hope I don't get it. I think wondering, uh, you know, that's just, I don't think that's a sign of early. I think that's just a sign of, by the way, it's called wrinkles. And I forget which, I pay for Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. And I forget which one it's on. But I recommend it to you. It's uh, animation. 
No, it's not. Take that back. I was thinking of something else. Uh, I forget. It's, uh, I think it's French or German. I can't remember, I believe. But I recommend it to you. Wrinkles, it's about a family and a father ends up going into a nursing home. But I really, it's really good. Um, that's something I need to, to do. As I, I pay for what I notes and stuff. I need to post, when I get some information, I need to post it. That's something I've been wanting to do for a long time too is uh, tell you about a movie or a series that I like. It's not going to, I never go to, I haven't been to a movie theater in a long time, so it's not going to be a review of, um, not going to be a review of, you know, a movie that's, let's see, who, let's go with Netflix, see what pops up. It's not going to be a review of a, um, current movie, but, um, do you know what it is? There we go. Uh, uh, Dave Chappelle here. I watched his hour long special and he made $50 million for that one, one hour special. And I like him. I think he's really funny. I didn't think uh, that was uh, as good. Now, is that the one? Or am I getting it mixed up? I think that's the... No, it wasn't. It was Chris Rock. Uh, David Chappelle was, you know, really funny. I watched his thing. It was Chris Rock's new video, his comedy special. He got $50 million for it. I didn't think it was that good. I mean, I liked it enough to watch it. And I uh, thought it was really good, but not as, you know, not as good. Um, and of course, he got $50 million for it. He talks about, Chris Rock talks about uh, being unfaithful a few times to his wife, who I believe is now his ex-wife. And uh, let's see what else it pops up here to jog my memory. By the way, I <clears throat> I think my ex-wife, I believe, or if she doesn't now, she used to sign into my account. And so a bunch of this stuff appears that, there's a lot of stuff that appears that they think that I like, that I have, you know, and she watches nonstop videos. She's... Uh, handicapped and confined, confined to a wheelchair and she watches videos. The West Wing, I loved that when it was on television. I didn't watch it when, when it was first on and everybody was, I, I, I caught it when it was first on but it was towards the end of it and uh, everybody was raving about it and I didn't get around to watching it and then when it re started reruns, then I watched it from the beginning, and oh, I loved it. And I wish we could make this um, the West Wing. Now, of course, the West Wing in the West Wing, uh, the president is a you know elected Democrat, and, uh, and so it's a Democratic White House. But there are. 
probably if you if you're a diehard if you're a, you know if you're just interested in politics and if you're just a a Republican and you're not one of the crazy stupid Republicans if you're a normal you know Republican I think you would enjoy the West Wing I mean there's some things you'd sit there and go eh, you know but uh, I think it should be required viewing for Trump. And uh, also for some other people I don't want to mention because I've had some people say things and then I'll say to them, well, it's the same person. <laughs> I discuss politics. I don't know why I discuss anything with this other person, but uh end up discussing politics sometimes. And the other person says incredibly stupid things and I'll say, you need to watch the West Wing, and that's covered. The, you know, the uh, each everything that that happens is, well, not everything with Trump, but I mean, things. If you watch that, you'd have some background. I mean, you should have learned it in civics in school, but since. Uh, but everybody should watch The West Wing. That's a great, uh, great show. It was a great... And I'll keep saying to this person, there is an episode that talks about, you know, the budget thing and shutting down the government. Uh, and that person has said to me about The West Wing, well, there's just a lot of talking And then I said, oh, let's see. There's an attempt to assassinate the president of the United States. Uh, the president's daughter is kidnapped. Uh, there's all types of things, you know, happening. But no, there's just talking. Um, I see they've got... Uh, Lincoln, I watched that before. I mean, a while back. I didn't know it was back, you know, back on. Uh, I used to like, you know, Mystery Science Theater 3000 or whatever it was called then. Was it called 2000 then or something? I don't remember. But, uh, I watched this uh, stand-up for drummers comedy, and it's an hour and five minutes. Um, I'm not really into music very much, but that was really a good, uh, especially if, you, <laughs> if you've ever been in a band or especially if you're a drummer. But even without that, it was a uh, really good, you know, comedy special. It's on Netflix. I'm going to stop here in a second with... Uh, just thought it might come across something here that might jog my memory about something. I used to love Star Trek, the original one. I, I can't, uh, I just can't watch it anymore. The Crown is very popular. I've, I've been trying to watch it, but I'm only up to season one, episode three. I don't know why that is, but I do think it's good. I just can't. Okay. That's it. Father Brown. Well, you can see. <laughs> I watched, uh, didn't watch it entirely. I only watched less than half of... Uh, I know it's popular, but couldn't get in my list. What's on my list? I don't even know. Okay, I did not watch the Cloverfield Paradox. I tried to and turned it almost off immediately. Uh... 
And I can't remember the end of the fucking world. Everything sucks. Okay, I tried to watch Eli Enhanced. Uh, or was it The Princess of Modern Fairy Tale? I watched all the episodes of uh, Baby Ballroom, actually. Can't believe that I did. And, uh, I don't know why I did, but I, I did. I didn't think that I would watch something like that. Grace and Frankie, that's these. Okay, I gotta click over here, don't I? There's President Bartlett from the West Wing. There's Barbarella. Uh, the two women, uh, their husbands turn out to be, they've been married for years, and their uh, husbands are gay, and they get a divorce, and the Two husbands are hooked up with each other, and Grace and Frankie are the wives, and they're living together, uh, kind of help each other or whatever. Um, let's see, what am I up to? Episode five. And I just, I'm tired of it, and I didn't really enjoy it. I mean, it's got fantastic actors in it. Uh, all four of them, and maybe some others, you know, the supporting actors, but got some great, great actors in it, but I don't know. I just think the writing is a problem or something, whether because this is like episode five and it's sort of the same thing. You know, the two women and there's some type of a family event and the two guys have to show up. Uh, there's another, you know, the next episode is there's an event at the school and the two guy, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's looks like they got the one writer and he just changes. Okay, let's see, flip a coin or open up the yellow pages. You probably don't know what yellow pages are, but stick a thing. Okay, plumbing. Okay, the wives are going to have a problem with plumbing and, you know, and the husband show up or something. I don't know, you know, so. Okay, let me go down real quick. The crown. Uh, big mouth. I don't know about that. Should, should that be, re, should that be, shown in school to kids of the appropriate, I'm not sure it to be an appropriate level, but could that be like sex education? But of course here in the United States, oh, school, local school boards control the grade schools and high schools, I guess. I went to Catholic schools, so I, you know, I wouldn't know, but uh, I, they're probably not appropriate for any, I don't know, on the other hand, it might be good sex education. Big Mouth on Netflix. Uh, oh, I know. What's it called? And where was it? It's like a re sort of a remake, sort of, of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Except this time, the... Bride's family is black. And it's really good. What's it called? I don't think it's on Netflix. I think it might be on Amazon. Should I go there? I don't know. No, I think I've been enough time doing this. Uh, oh, 
uh, one reason I demonetize this, so I'm not going to make any money no matter how many people watch it, but it doesn't matter anyway because I don't have that many people watching these videos. I upload a video. Some people upload a video and 20,000 people or 50,000 people watch it in a day's time or something, and in a few days' time, they've got a million that have watched it or whatever. I upload a video and... Uh, A week later, 150 people have watched it. And then some videos, you know, less than 100 have watched it. And I got I got some videos that 35,000 people watched a long time ago. Uh, but in general, so it, it doesn't, you know, I'm not giving up any money by not trying to make money, but I don't want to make money off the tragedy and off of any tragedy. Uh as I probably mentioned too many times, I worked hospital security for 30 years. Um, I actually worked security longer than that, uh, but I just started counting when I, I didn't count the months or year or whatever it was before, and I don't really count the um, when I stopped in 2000, working hospital security after 30 years, I um, worked after that. In Miami, I worked. Well, in Orlando, I went to a contract guard agency and went in there and just wanted, you know, hey, I, I'm retired, but if you got a job, you know, sitting in a lobby someplace just checking people in and out, I'll take it. And they looked at my thing and, oh, my God, hospital security, 30 years, you know, blah, 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 you know. And I didn't want to take it, but I did. And that was terrible. That was HCA, Health Corporation of America, I believe, hospital. Uh, worst, and I worked in Kansas City for like for 30 years, and I worked at different hospitals. And that hospital in the Orlando area was the worst hospital I've ever seen. It was, I couldn't stand it. It was, it was bad, everything. It was just, oh, horrible. Then uh, I came back to Texas and I worked, then 9-11 had happened at some point in there. And uh, I worked uh, Love Field, FAA Control Tower Security, and then I worked at, uh, forget, another control tower at a small airport there in Texas, FAA Control Tower Security. And then I ended up going to Miami, and I worked security at a shopping mall, Dayland Mall, for about a year. And that was terrible in a way because of the people I worked with and because of the management, because of, it was just, it was horrendous. It was awful. Then I ended up uh, quitting, but uh, I found out after I quit, they were going to fire me. <laughs> I quit before they could fire me. And then I went to work across the street at CompUSA and I actually, I was just pricing stuff I was the only one putting the prices on the shelves. They don't put prices on the individual item. And so I was just pricing them and, uh, I mean, printing out. The, I didn't decide what the price was. I just went to the computer and printed out and then put the, and I, did, that was, I was the only one doing that. And I loved that until my prostate gave out on me. And... Uh, when you have a prostate problem and then you go to work and you piss the floor at work, it's time to uh, quit. So, uh, but when I was working in Kansas City, Missouri for those 30 years, so I was working hospital security, but I was also a reserve police officer. I was a, well, 
reserve police officer for a small police department for years. Uh, then for about 12 years, I had a full-time Cass County Deputy Sheriff's Commission, and it was a full commission. Uh, even their reserve deputies and uh, other people they had, they didn't have full commissions. I had a full commission, but I never really had to, I never, never really had to use it. But I had it in my pocket, and there was a few times I could have whipped it out, but I never, you know, I, I didn't. There was one time, well, I didn't, I just, it was, uh, one time a lady at the at the hospital had brought her infant in and the uh, ER doctor said, you know, this baby needs to go to Children's Mercy Hospital, you know, right away. And the lady said, no, I'm, uh, no, I, I don't, you know, and the doctor said, no, your baby here is in, in, needs to go immediately by ambulance to Children's Mercy Hospital. And uh, so he tried everything, and the nurse went in. You know, the nurse said, well, let me, you know, went in and talked to the lady or whatever. And then uh, no success. She was using every, you know, no, uh, I'll go home. Then I'll take the baby. Uh, my husband's at home. Uh, I'll go get him or whatever. And they and the doctor said, Jim, can you can you help us? This baby is needs to get to the and she won't do it. And so then I went in and uh, you know tried talking to her a little bit and she said, oh my husband's at home and I'll go get him and and I you know well can't he meet you there? Well no and and uh, I've got the car and I said well I'm, and I would have I would have done it myself but I said you know I said well have the police or the ambulance pick him you know bring him here to no 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 I'll, I'll just go home or whatever and so anyway I said uh, well ma'am I'm a Cass County Deputy Sheriff and you're going to force my hand I'm going to have to you know how did I put it? Uh, not take control. I can't remember how I said it at the time. You know, I'm going to have to... Anyway, basic, you know. And, I, of course, I would have done it when I said I was going to do something. Whenever I said I was going to do it, no matter what it was, I did it. But that was... I didn't want to do it. But I would have done it because I said I was going to, you know. I'm going to have to, you know, take custody of this infant... And uh, she said, oh, you, you guys already, Cass County, has, have already taken my other children from me. I don't want that to happen. I'll, I'll go ahead and let the, go with the ambulance and whatever. So that was taken care of. And how did I get on that subject? Oh, I don't remember. In fact, where am I? Um School security guards don't love the children. School security guards don't love the children. What? Uh, I don't think I want to read that. Um, anyway, when this shooting happened in... Uh, oh, I, was, that's, I think that's what I was going to say. I worked, um, when I was working hospital security for 30 years, secondary jobs that I had for a contract guard agency, and I went Burns, Pinkerton, Wells Fargo, and then a bunch of other companies that you haven't heard of that are local or regional or something. And so I worked, uh, oh, wow. You name a place, and I worked there, factories, um, Shopping, big shopping mall. Um, well, just about any place you can, you know, hotels, motels, all kinds of all kinds of places. Um, but 
And then I forgot why I was going to tell you why I had worked all those different places. I worked, never really, I worked at a school, but never, not, um, worked a, a radio television station. Um, I told you that little story one time. But I, um, I should have live streamed this. Um, but the deputy who stayed outside during, oh, anyway, the school I worked at, it was not, I worked at the Kansas City Art Institute, but I was assigned, this was a contract guard thing, I was assigned just to be in a very small art gallery that they had to watch the art, you know, watch the artwork. And so that was, you know, wasn't like being a school resource officer or something like that. Um, but when the shooting took place, right away they were interviewing some girl and she says that when the shooting started, then she started running and then she ran outside and there was a friend of a girlfriend of hers out there and they were together and that the security guard told her and others, run, run, run. And so she said, then she described, you know, she ran, they came, she came to the chain link fence or whatever and she threw her laptop over and climbed up the fence and did all that. And so then I was uh, talking to somebody and I said, you know, this, because we were talking about it, and I said, this girl said that there was security there and, you know, he told her to run. I said, I'd really like to know, uh, was he a security officer or was he a school resource officer, uh, off-duty uh, police officer, uh, uh, you know, and I'd... I'd just like to know, and was he armed? If he was a, just a security guard, was he armed? And this person I was talking to, yeah, I'd like to know that too. And then it came out that they had a uh, off-duty, no, they had a sheriff's deputy who worked there as a school armed, of course, and I think that was his regular assignment. And then they come up with this, uh, the fact that he didn't go into the building and they have video of him, I guess, outside for four minutes, you know, just at one side of the building or whatever, but he didn't go in. Um, remember with Columbine in Colorado, um, that school shooting, the police arrived, large numbers, uh, bigger, you know, city and everything, large numbers of police officers and EMS and fire department, I guess, and everything else, and they didn't enter the building. And uh, it came out, you know, that they just, they had a plan, and their plan was secure the premises and wait for... SWAT teams or whatever to go in. And that was kind of, I thought, no, you should, I can understand, you know. And the thing is, he had two shooters in who both committed suicide. And they also had brought in some type of bombs that they had made. I don't think they, I don't think they were able to set any of them off. I don't think they were big bombs. I'm not sure what they were, you know, gasoline or something I don't know I can't remember but but uh, this this guy here the deputy who did not go in who was a school resource officer what I said when I first heard about that or when I heard that there was a security guard there turns out he wasn't it was a, you know a law enforcement officer a peace officer sworn you know um I thought to myself, and I think I told this other person, oh, I, I hope that he wasn't someplace in there that 
it's going to look, you know, look bad for him because I thought, you know, they have one, sec- it's a big school. You have one security officer or you have one officer. You can't be everywhere at, you know, at once. You need to know where to be, you know, when people are coming and going, what doors are, you know, uh, secured and which ones aren't secured. Although you'll have a place like that, you'd, you would have kids going out doors that would make them, you know, somebody could just wait for them to pop out, walk in. You have people too that will, even people who should know better. I mean, in that situation, teachers or you know, administrator would block a door open or something, so they would, so they could go out to their car to get a uh, paper they needed. Or I mean, it just it's just. But you have to know where to be. But then also, there's times if you're doing that kind of a job. I, like I said, I never really worked. I don't think a school security, but. You you know, there's times that you're going to take a break. There's times that you're going to have lunch. And, uh, you know, when I worked hospital security, when I, uh, you know, took a lunch, <laughs> I sat, unless the place was totally filled, and I just took a seat. But if it wasn't, you know, I took a, a seat where I could see Everybody who came into the cafeteria, I could see down the hall. I could maybe look out a window and that type of stuff. But I thought, I hope this poor guy, you know, maybe, uh, of course, I don't think I knew exactly what time. It was about time for the school to close. But I was thinking, you know, well, if it was around lunchtime and he's sitting having lunch and something happens, but, um, of course, it turns out, way totally different than school security guards don't love the children. Oh, I don't know. My God, Trump. Please, I don't want this video to start. I hate CNN the way they start these videos. Okay, I don't know, too, why in the hell that they have, you know, a headline like that. And then they have a video. Sometimes the video is even old, you know. Uh, it'll be, they'll talk about something and... Uh, okay, here it is, way down here. School security guards, Trump, school security guard, oh, guard, didn't love the children. Oh, my God. President Trump responding to a reporter's question about what legislation he wants to see in the wake of the Parkland shooting spoke about Deputy Scott Peterson, the security officer who was outside the building but never went inside to stop the shooting. Frankly, you had a a gun, and he was outside as a guard, and he decided not to go in. This was not his finest moment. Trump said of Peterson's decision to stay outside that I can tell you he waited and he didn't want to go into the school. I'm going to stop doing that. A security guard doesn't know the children, doesn't love the children, Trump said. The man standing outside the school the other day doesn't love the children, probably doesn't know the children. The teachers love their children. No, I, bet, I bet they don't, really. I mean, this is not funny, but, you know, they love their pupils. They love their students. They're doing it also for love. Sorry for laughing, but the point being, you know, (laughs) the teachers probably do hate the kids. I take that back. That's inappropriate. 
right? Um, anyway, I think that segues, is that the correct word to a subject that maybe you should fit in here? And that's that... Um, Well, the problem with guns, by the way, I used to be an NRA member for years. I owned three or four rifles. The rifles I purchased were mainly older rifles like the Springfield 03 and a German Mauser and stuff like that. I wasn't trying to collect. Uh, I loved the American Rifleman, their magazine. And I finally, after a few years... The American Rifleman was one of the few magazines that I like read everything, start to be, you know, all the way through all the ads, everything else. But when they got crazy uh, about the government trying to take their guns away and, and you've, you know, all that, I mean, that was back probably in early 60s, something like that. The government hasn't taken any weapons away yet. That was in the 60s. What is this, 58 years later or something? Nobody's, the government's not taking any guns away. Um, but, this, well, the solution is, and I raved about this on my blog, and my blog doesn't, you know, and I might have even raved about it on YouTube, maybe not. But when they went to instant background checks. I said, no, no. They need a complete police, you know, background check on the person. Take two or three days. Take however, how much you have to take, but do a complete background check. Check with the neighbors, check with the employers, check with the, the school, check, you know. And then they would... A lot of this, with a complete background check, you would have, uh, you'd pick, you know, you'd find that stuff. You'd even go for a background check when you talk to the person. Some of them, believe me, you're not going to believe this, but there's some of them. You could just do a little talk. Of course, you need to do a complete check of everything. But there's some of these people, you could honestly say, why do you want a gun? You know, and they'd say, uh, these fucking N people live next door to me and they walk across my lawn and I'm going to fucking shoot them, you know, or something like that. Or you'd be talking to the person and, you know, they, you know, uh, the dog from the, what was that, what was that shooting? This dog, you know, is satanic. And has been talking to me and putting words and you know things into my brain. You would you would actually eliminate some of those people, and then you would eliminate a lot more people when you did a complete background check. When, you know when you found out that the neighbor said, "Oh well, you know, such and such," and you could do safeguards. Um, it could be that when the police do a background check. And they don't have to tell the person, you know, I'm just checking, you know, about, you know, Joe, your next door neighbor, you know, Joe Brown, your next door neighbor. What can you tell me, you know, about him and whatever their questions, you know, would be. And if the people say, why are you asking, you know, I'm, uh, it's a background, just a background check, something to make the people, which it would be the truth, you know. Uh, people would think, oh, maybe he's applying for a, you know, a federal job or something. Maybe he's applying for a job. And you really wouldn't have to have charge the people who are having the background check. Don't charge them the entire amount of what it costs to, you know, maybe the police officer is making $20 an hour. And uh, don't charge the per. you know, he's at the police station and he drives over here. And it takes 20 minutes to get there. And then he talks to somebody there for, you know, 
25 minutes and then he drives someplace. Don't take that and then multiply it by, okay, $20 an hour or something. You know, have a a flat $25 charge. And if your background check is done, you know, that's good for a year. So you would, next time you want to purchase a gun, I'd still do, a, you know, I'd, I'd still do a background check, but not charge the person $20 and not do the same. You know, if he had a background check six months ago, just look through it, you know, see if anything pops out to you. Do a little check on the computer to say, you know, oh, the guy's wife filed for divorce uh, last month and she got a restraining order against him. Ah, okay, you know, something like so. Charge, twenty. let's say $25 for the background. Maybe it should be $50, I don't know. Charge the amount and, and it wouldn't have to be the police doing it. You could, if it's a police department, if it's a city where there's going to be a lot of, I don't know whether the checks would be like through the county, you know, or through the city or however it would be arranged. But um, if some police department, well, we don't, we don't have enough officers to, you know, um, do these background checks. Well, if it's $50 for a background check coming in, hire uh, security personnel or, uh, you know, somebody uh, to, you know, to do the, the checks. They wouldn't be police officers. Uh, they would be community related. I'd be, you know, something they wouldn't have to be uh, firearms trained or, you know, whatever. Although, I don't think somebody, well, they shouldn't be in uniform then if they're, you know, but it could be, you. that, that all could be worked out. So complete background check. The way it is now, you go and the NRA and Republicans, right-wing extremists, they've changed, the, the, messed with the law. So you go to have a background check, you go buy, you go, want to buy an assault rifle or whatever, you go in the gun store. You say, I like that one right there. I'm not sure that you need a background check to buy an assault rifle. Anyway, you go in to buy your, your weapon at the gun store and they're going to use the back, you know, your name, your social security number, whatever, your an ID. Hopefully they look at all that. They put you in the computer and pops back at nothing, you know, that, okay. So you get it. But the way the pro gun people have screwed with the system is if it doesn't come back, apparently within, I don't know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, if, if there's nothing, if it doesn't come back, they have to, you know, the, you have to be, you have to be approved. I say if the information doesn't, if it doesn't pop back and say yes or no, I'd say no, you know, until they find out why, but that's not the way it works. But so anyway, complete background check. You should not be able to, now this, you know, you should not be able to buy military weapons. You know, assault rifles, AK-47s, don't give me any crap about, uh, an AK-47 is not an assault rifle, or so, you know, but I had to carry a gun my entire, well, I worked as a welder for 10 or so years before I ended up in security or whatever, but I had to carry a gun, you know, don't, I don't, had to qualify with it every year, blah, 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 blah. Fuck you. I don't want to hear anything from you about it's not an assault rifle because it doesn't have a a, a bayonet uh, clip on it or it doesn't. I, mean, I don't fucking care. That's a bunch of, you know, anybody who's using that is, you know, somebody tells their story about a shooting or whatever. And they say, oh, the the, the person, you know, he had an AK-47, an assault rifle, or he had such and such. 
such and such a rifle and it was an assault, you know, whatever. And you don't talk, you don't listen to the person saying, well, this person had his brains blown out in front of me and it splattered on me. Uh, I was laying on the floor and the only reason I'm not dead is because somebody else who was shot fall, fell on top of me and was bleeding out. All these people will, all you people like that will say is, it wasn't an assault rifle, so this person doesn't know anything and ignore the rest of it. So cut that crap out. So you should not, in my opinion, should not be able to even purchase. Now, I'm not sure what you do about the <laughs> millions of them that are out there. I don't know what you do about those. That's something that people would have to figure out. But you shouldn't be able now to go in and purchase them. And definitely you should not be able to get clips that hold 30 rounds or whatever. When I was working in, at first I carried a 38. It was, you couldn't even, I had a great revolver, uh, the Smith & Wesson Outdoorsman. Uh, it was a 38, but it was on a 44 frame. And, uh, I wish I still had it, but there's a reason I can't have, or, or that I, I can, but I don't want to have a weapon around. Um, but, so you, in my opinion, you should not be able to buy military type of, of weapons. You don't need them. Even if you fucking live in Montana or Alaska where you have bears or whatever, you do not need a weapon that you have or that you put clips in there that are 30 rounds. If you do need that, you shouldn't be fucking living in Alaska or Montana or whatever. Go to San Francisco or something, you know. Um, so... Complete background check, thorough background check. You should not be able to buy assault weapons, military type weapons. You should not be able to get a clip that holds 30 rounds. I'm not sure at what point, you know, where the cutoff is. If you say you can't have one that holds 29 rounds, uh, they'll put out a 29, you know, round one my when I went to Smith and Weston auto 40 caliber the clip held 11 rounds so what we did is you know popped it into the gun chambered around dropped the clip put another round in and I put it back into my weapon and I had 12 rounds and my weapon. Um, and then I carried two extra clips. Uh, by the way, <clears throat> most of the hospital security work that I did, I was probably half of that 30 years that I worked or more, I was in the worst neighborhood in the Kansas City area, the most dangerous one. And uh, first hospital I worked at, St. Joseph Hospital, we had 10 security officers. Uh, during the three and a half years I was there, uh, we had Dan Stagel shot permanently disabled. And we had John Gallegas shot and killed. He managed to shoot the guy who shot him. Uh, then before I went to Trinity, I was already hired in at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, but I had, uh, you know, given notice at the uh, hospital that I worked at. I told you that story also, the fact that when a second security officer was shot, John, he had, uh, he worked day shift, and at that time, I was working second shift. I'd gone over to the second shift to fill in for... Uh, 
Um, but anyway, John was working uh, the day shift, so I came in to relieve him, and uh, while I was waiting for the change or whatever, I was shining my shoes, and uh, he said, Jim, I can't believe, man of your age, and you don't know how to shine your shoes. You weren't in the military, were you? And I said, no. And uh, he said, here, and he shined my shoes for me. And he said, doesn't that look better? I said, yeah, John. So we talked a little bit, and I went home, and uh, four or five hours later, they called me that he'd been shot at, you know, at 9.15 p.m. at work. Oh, but anyway, so, oh, the hospital administrator, I when the first security officer was shot at St. Joe Hospital, I said, you need to put a gate up across here because that's where the two guys came through, and you need to get bulletproof vests, I told the hospital administrator, and we didn't get them. And when then, when John was shot, um, when the hospital administrator pulled in and his Lincoln Continental Mark IV, I went over and I said, there's John's blood on the ground. Now are you going to do what I told you needed to be done, you know, some months ago? And he said, no, Jim, I'm not going to. Maybe I'll get you guys a horse. And then I sent every fucking doctor and man, it was amazing because their parking lot was right there. And that was my day to work in that parking lot. And I sent every one of them into his office. And I told you this story before, but maybe you weren't, didn't watch that video. The suck-ass assistant administrator of the hospital, and I'd worked welding all my life until I started well, until I got married, and then we had a tropical fish shop for four years, and blah, blah, blah. And then I ended up working security, and St. Joe Hospital was really the first security place that I worked. Well, I had a my own patrol service for about a year, but uh, I didn't really know what a suck-ass was, a uh, brown noser or whatever you want to call him. This guy was, and the assist, he was the assistant administrator, and he came out. I'd never seen him come out without following out the hospital administrator. Um, he came out, acted like he was going to his car. And, oh, Jim, I guess I don't need to go to my car. Oh, by the way, we're going to put that gate up across there that you want, and we're going to get bulletproof vests for you guys. Then he went back inside. I stuck around long enough to make sure. In fact, they sent me to get pick up the bulletproof vest when they had it finally. But... Uh, Anyway, I was, man, the doc, ER doctors there, or not the ER doctors, the doctors, when I went over, every one of them went to the administrator, you know, oh, well, I'll make sure the hospital does it, or I'll pay for it myself if I have to, or every one of them went to his office. But I knew my, you ever see the movie, what, uh, is it Viva La Pata, or uh, the Mexican... Uh, general and became president, I think, of her. Anyway, somebody, he circles, you know, the peasants come to uh, make some request. And uh, Zapata, who was a peasant or whatever, says, what about the landowners who, you know, do such and such? What's your name? circle it. So that's what I, I said. My name has been circled. So I got a job at Trinity Lutheran Hospital. But it's so, okay. I had given my notice. Uh, Lloyd Aikens, a security officer there, was during this two-week period that, uh, of course, I wasn't leaving because two of my friends had been shot in a three-and-a-half-year period. I was leaving because I knew that my name had been circled. Uh but anyway, he was, Lloyd Aikens lived a few blocks from Trinity Lutheran Hospital, and he was walking to work. He worked a midnight shift, and he was not actually on hospital property, but if he had taken a step off the sidewalk, he would have been. 
And a guy comes up with a gun and says, give me your money or something like that. And Lloyd says, uh, I don't think your gun is loaded. And the guy goes, oh, yeah? And shot him. It was a defective round. It barely broke the skin on John's. John's arm was up like he barely broke the skin. Lloyd didn't pull out his gun and blasted him. He should have. Lloyd just ran down to the emergency room. I've been shot, you know, and then they looked at him. And I'm not sure what they said. Let's say, let's say they said, uh, well, we'll pour some alcohol over it and maybe get you a tetanus, you know. I like Lloyd. Nobody else did, but he, he was midnight shift supervisor. I, he, I had him out to my house because he didn't have a car and he, I had him out to my house at least once and he bounced my kids on his knee and so uh, anyway, then I went to Trinity Lutheran Hospital. And why did I get on that subject? Because I don't think that was it. I think I was going to build up to something else and didn't get it done for some reason. Oh, it was about gun control. Oh, that was it. Okay, I worked at... Uh, St. Joseph Hospital for three and a half years. No accidental gunfire, you know. No, no officer accidentally had his gun discharged. There was one time the hospital there, a Catholic hospital at that time was really, well, that was the only Catholic hospital I worked at, but like the RN who was in charge of the emergency room, of course, I was a doctor, you know, but the RN who was in charge, she was a nun and an RN in charge. Uh, the lab, there was a nun there who was a pathologist or whatever. She was in charge of the lab. Uh, the pharmacy, there was a nun there who was a pharmacist and she was in charge of the, and it made my job or security job really easy. Yeah, you go to this nun and you say, but anyway, the nun in charge of who I never hardly ever saw, uh, she was mistaken, but you know, it's, she said the word went out from her to the, like to the switchboard operator or whatever. If the hold up alarm goes off in pharmacy, do not notify security. She was afraid, I don't know, of a shootout or something rather. But I was working one one day. It was icy weather. I mean, it was, and that hospital, St. Joe Hospital. The nuns were really cheap. I mean, you know, because they wanted X amount of money to go to their uh, mother house or whatever, whatever the you know, and then they wanted X amount of money to go to the local diocese. They wanted X amount of money to go to the Pope's fund or whatever stuff like that. They were really frugal, let's say. But um, anyway, oh, okay. So they, but what surprised me was they didn't have the snow plowed or salt or anything put out. They just let it melt. And the word was, I don't know if this is truth or not, that that they thought, and which maybe is correct, that if they didn't do anything, their liability would be very little. But if they went out and had it shoveled and then it froze over a little bit and then somebody fell, or if they put salt out and then somebody fell or, or whatever, so they didn't do anything. Um, so anyway, it was really icy and it was piled up, you know, ice and snow had melted and it, Anyway, I responded on the, the alarm went off for the pharmacy holdup. I think in three and a half years, that was the only time it went off. Anyway, I responded, you know, I unsnapped my weapon and whatever. And then I went and looked and then I could see life was, you know, normal. And then the call came, you know, I disregard the alarm, they accidentally hit it or something. And so then I went back to the parking lot. And Dr., I think it was Dr. Skinner, really nice, an old, probably my age now, <laughs> but an, an old doctor. And he pulled in 
and got out, and I thought, oh, hell, he's going to break his fucking leg, you know, I better go over. So I wanted to get over there as quick as I could so he didn't fall. Went running with my gun, went <laughs> my holster. That's the only time that ever happened. That's the only time that ever happened. Slid across, <laughs> slid across the ice, you know, and landed up at his feet, basically. And I went over and holstered, and then I snapped it down. But, um, oh, okay. So at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, before I went to work there, one of the officers was dry firing his gun up in the security office on the sixth floor. By the way, security officers shouldn't be on the sixth floor. They should be down on the ground floor. They should be by the emergency room or, you know, but of course it depends on the type of business you have. And anyway, uh, something I had to deal with was what I call knee jerk security. I didn't see it there so much. I don't think. No, because the director of security racist, but, uh, he was good at planning. He wasn't good at dealing with people, but, but, uh, another hospital that I worked at part time, uh, later that entire operation was knee jerk security, but I don't want to get into that now because we're talking about fire. Okay. Before I went to work at uh, Trinity Lutheran Hospital, a guy was up here dry firing his gun and he had a round in it, put a hole in the wall. When I came to work there, I said, oh, see that, you know. Um, so those things happen. Um, I do not remember. Oh, yeah, while I was working at Trinity. Um, a few years later, I worked there five and a half years. It was during the Republican convention and Ford was, I believe, president in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, there was one of the officers. We went to 12 hour shifts uh, for that. And we were all, we called an extra security, did all kinds of, we didn't need it. I told the director of security we wouldn't need it. He ordered in us. <laughs> he was a retired major. I think he told me that he was a retired colonel. He tended to exaggerate. He tended to lie. Uh, Trump and him, no, except he was smart, not Trump. But um, anyway, he was a retired major on disability, disability retirement. But he ordered in a special phone. The hospital had a phone system. He ordered in for the two weeks a special phone, a red phone. Now, I shouldn't laugh at him for ordering a red phone because I actually at home, I loved, this is when they had dial, you know, not push button. And I actually had a red phone. You know, I had my choice. I naturally wanted a red. He had a red phone so he could call, you know, the uh, Secret Service or whatever. Uh, but... So they had an officer there. Okay, so one of the officers that got hired in, I didn't hire him in, although later I did do hiring for security. Um, but anyway, he was a young guy. Well, I was a young guy too then, 19, 1970s, 75, someplace like that. Uh, he brought in gun magazines when he came to work and he constantly, you know, be in the office, he'd take his gun out and check to make sure, which is, you know, check to make sure he'd be cleaning it or, you know, whatever. He just gun, 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 gun. And, uh, he had an accidental discharge down coming in to work for the 12 hour shift down by respiratory therapy and uh, the uh, director of security said uh, that he dropped his gun and it went off and I said 
No, it didn't. And he says, yeah, the director of security, Bob Ross. No, yeah, no, it, I said, it did not. I said, you, you can drop these guns and they don't go off. Yeah, in the old days, there wasn't a plate that came up, you know, to block the firing pin or whatever. I said, no, these guns, I'm not going to drop it, but you can drop it. They're not going to go off. And I said, he's lying. And he said, no, no. And he said, in fact, I've written up a directive here. From now on, all security officers, you have to have the chamber underneath the firing pin has to be an empty chamber. And uh, I said, I'm not going to have an empty chamber. You know, I'm not going to have only five rounds of my weapon. I'm going to, he says, well, this is, I've written this policy up, you know, and, and you have to do it. And I said, I'm not doing it. And I didn't get fired. He could have, you know, he could have fired me, you know, for it. And I didn't carry an empty round underneath, you know. I had six rounds. Uh, of course, a few years later, he did fire me. Not for that, but for other stuff. Actually, for he was so racist that uh, I kept challenging him on it, and uh, he got tired, and uh, he went to administration, not telling him that. Well, he'd been to administration, administration. He'd well, been to human resources, and human resources, as uh, Jim's correct, about light, that was about lie detector test or whatever. And, but he went to administration and uh, that was over. Well, the hospital put out a statement to all employees, such and such day is going to be boss appreciation day. Do something for your boss. Tell your boss that you appreciate and the security department, oh, God, you know, I had two people on the day shift. I supervised uh, five security officers on the day shift and seven parking lot attendants. I had to do reviews for them and all that kind of stuff. And two of my people, one was female, nice, she a hard worker, great woman, she just had something, and she couldn't do reports well. And I tried. She just had something. She didn't do it, but that's fine. She did everything else uh, fine. I mean, so that was okay. And then there was a security officer who uh, was gay. Nobody else, well, there was a few other people, you know. People didn't know, and he didn't, you know, he was gay. And so he would, and he had worked at the hospital for years before he transferred into security. He wanted to be a nurse, and he was really smart. I forget the subject. There was, And he took it at least twice in college. I forget what the subject was. Of course, I would not have been able to pass it, and he couldn't pass it. So he just worked as an ER orderly, and then he transferred into security. But anyway, he was just terrified that he was going to be fired and not ha lose his job or something rather. And so, anyway, both of them were, well, she was fine. He was fine, except uh, he didn't think that the hospital needed security. He thought that we could be let go at any time. He was just, uh, I liked him. But anyway... They both decided, oh yeah, for the boss, we're, for our boss, we're going to have, you know, cake and a little party and give him some kind of a little gift and and uh, whatever. And I said, well, I don't think it's a good idea, but you know, okay, fine, you know. And then so we were working the day shift. So then the second shift came in to relieve us, you know, later, and they said. You fucking suck asses throwing a party for you know. For Bob Ross, that SOB, fuck him, blah, blah. Of course, they didn't do that. The second shift would, they'd go and uh, do the exact opposite to him, you know. That, but, so, I, oh, shit, you know. So, so then the, the, when I came in for the next day's shift, um, 
the midnight shift. Of course, I was relieving the midnight shift. And those guys, you bunch of... We saw the thing here on the bulletin board about... Of course, I didn't put it up, you know. Carol and... Uh, I think it was Carol and... Uh, anyway. Put it up. And I'd already told them I didn't think it was a good idea, but they put it up. So uh, I came in and, of course, the third shift said, you bunch of suck asses, you know, blah, 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 uh, whatever. So then I, when I saw uh, Carol and uh, I said, you know, this is really a bad idea. The second shift f fucking doesn't want any part of it. They're you know, saying the following about us. And I said, then I come in this morning and the day shift does. I said, it's really a bad idea. I don't think you should do it. And they said, oh, okay, we're not going to do it. And then later they posted a thing, you know, a collection thing or whatever for the thing. They, they said, well, we just want to go, hey, we're going to go ahead and do it for Mr. Ross. And I said, it's a bad idea. So I wrote them up. And for, you know, taking action, which was detrimental to to uh, the department's, uh, oh, forget how I put it. And I put in there, the, you know, blah, 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 uh, that uh, no disciplinary action is called for. I just want the employees to know that in the future they should not, they should try to do everything they can to not cause dissension within the department. And I waited until the director of security had his day and had his little party. I waited until it was over that day. And then I put the things in his tray because he had to countersign them. He had, I wrote him up and he had to approve them. And I put him in his tray. And uh, I really think that it is, I don't think that he should have gone crazy on me. Do you? Maybe you disagree. But he went fucking crazy. He went storming uh, out of the office, heading, to, head his, heading with him to administration or whatever. I found out later, of course, that he, you know, he went down there and I want Jim Howard fired. Uh, and uh, administration, I found out later, uh, told him no. Uh, you can't fire him, not for that. Um, if you don't want him as a supervisor, as one of your supervisors. Uh, you can tell him he's not going to be a supervisor anymore, but you can't fire him. And uh, so then we we just happened, it was a day we had a departmental meeting, which we had every two or three months. And um, so he comes into the meeting where all of the officers are, and he says, I just want you all to know that I'm not going to allow any backstabbing in this department. I'm going to take care of this. There's, no, there's not going to be any backstabbing in this department. And then uh, oh, anyway, there was a small fire outside of the administrative window and he, the director of security, this guy, Bob Ross, I actually liked him. I didn't like some of the way, for some reason I liked him. I liked a lot of people. It, if, in order not for me to get along, be able to work with you or something, you had to be a real SOP. And there were very few of people that I couldn't, that I didn't, you know, that there was a problem. And, uh, but uh, anyway, there was a small fire. So I'm in the thing and the call came on a radio and normally, which I did not agree with, and uh, he would 
tell the switchboard operator or whatever, no calls for security. We're having a meeting for two hours, you know. Uh, but anyway, a call came that there was a fire outside. Them, so I went down, stamped it out. I came back. When I came back in, all the other security officers, you know, were like not looking at me, you know, whatever. Uh, but I already knew, you know. So, um, um, oh, and I said, well, I just saved the hospital. Uh, the There was a fire outside of the uh, administrative office. Of course, I didn't, you know, I knew that, you know, I said, I just saved the hospital. The fire right up because he would, the director of security would be, he'd call me, you know. Oh, at, you know, administration, they said there's there's a car outside, you know, whatever, and I'd tell him, you know, I'd tell administration to close their curtains, you know, but he was, I was on a, one part of the hospital complex one time and in a parking lot, I had to watch this parking lot, and there was a street there, Main Street of Kansas City, Missouri, and a woman walked out and got hit by a car and whatever, and I pulled the patrol car, I right away and I got a radio, you know, we need an ambulance and the police, a lady just got hit, you know. I pulled the patrol car out there to, so she didn't get run over again, and and he immediately calls me, Jim, is that one of our employees, or whatever, and I said, uh, Mr. Ross, just stay off the radio, because he wanted to call administration right away and tell them he would do that, and it was always a bad idea for him to do that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so he, anyway, I forgot my track there, but he went, so I knew I was going to be fired. And, uh, so that was a Friday, Saturday and Sunday. I came in and worked Monday. I came in and worked. And when I came in Friday, Monday, I went and got my radio and got the keys, and then I went to the parking garage where I had seven parking lot attendants that were, but they wouldn't, they knew, you know, the ones that two were at the gate, post or whatever. I came down, and I was just down there, you know, waiting. And they said, what's going on, Jim? I said, eh, nothing. Yeah, something's going on. I said, well, I'm going to be fired, you know. And they, oh, <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to be fired. And, uh, uh, so anyway, I, what I didn't know and I found out later was, you know, like he went to administration and they said no. And then two, it had been agreed that because he, we'd had trouble, be, I had done four grievances and won them all, by the way, against him. And they always had somebody <laughs> with him when I went to keep him from freaking out doing something, you know, whatever. So it was arranged that I... Uh, he was going to call me up to his office at such and such a time. Well, he called me up like an hour early. And so the director of human resources was supposed to be there when he talked to me. So I went up, I walked in, and he said, you're fired. And I said, okay. And I walked out. I already had paperwork in a car. I drove over to, well, I didn't go over in uniform. I must have, anyway, I went directly over to the uh, federal, whatever federal agency it was. I made a mistake. I was there for hours. The guy, the lawyer was, because I had all the statements. I had uh, everything that he had done. I'd always written it down. Uh, and I'd gone over to, um, anyway, I had all the information. And I brought it in my car with me and had it. Went over. And anyway, the lawyer wrote for hours. I sat there and told him, went through dates, times, what he said. Uh, and uh, my stomach started growling. I started getting physically sick. I needed to eat, you know, whatever. But what I should have done later, although I didn't care, I I've, I've been trying to... Well, it had been arranged at that hospital. I had told him, I said, I just, I do not want to be, 
your super. I stopped wearing my insignias, you know, of rank, sergeant's rank at that time. And, uh, and I told him, I just don't want to. It had been all arranged with him, and he was happy about it. And with the Human Resources Department, it had been put in my merit review or whatever that the next opening in the biomed department, I was to get the job. And the guy in charge of the biomed department had interviewed me and wanted me, you know, because of my computer experience at that time. I did not take a course in biomed, you know, or electronics or whatever, but because of my computer experience, he was anxious for me. And I'd been telling he had to come every morning and pick up the keys to his department. And when I was there, I'd say, oh, God, help me. Do you have a note? He says, Jim, there's three or four guys in the department. They're looking. And I said, hurry up. I can't stand another day of this, you know. So anyway, uh, I went up. I was told, anyway, I went over what I should have done, although I didn't care. Every job I've been fired, I was fired from two jobs. I was going to be fired, like I told you before, from another one. But I, I didn't know that I was going to get fired. And I quit. And uh, But anyway, every job I quit, I was always happy to, to go. And I was happy with this one at Trinity. I really was happy. I was glad I got fired. Um, but I found out later that he wasn't supposed to fire me. And the human resources director was supposed to be there to make sure that he didn't fire me or that he handled things correctly or whatever. But uh, what I should have done is gone to, what, EEOC, which I'd have probably been the only white person there. I'm sure they had an office someplace. If I'd have gone over there, walked in, and uh, I would have had the information also. Uh, everything I had would have also worked over there. In fact, it would have worked better. I could have gone over there and they, I'd have probably got hired back, probably got hired back at getting his job, although I wouldn't have taken it, you know. I'd, but it, I sort of should have gone to, because I had some dealings with, you know, I actually had some dealings with the lady who was the investigator for the EEOC Equal Opportunity whatever it was, a black lady. And she later became a city councilwoman and, I don't know, maybe a mayoral... Uh, she wasn't the mayor, but she might have ran for the mayor or something. She, and she was a... She was a bitch. Man, she was something else. She had... There'd been an act, a minor accident in the parking lot, and I went. I responded on it. It varies with jurisdictions or whatever. In Kansas City, Missouri, if there's an accident on private property, and if you have, if there's an accident on private property, the police uh, they don't come. Now, if there's an injury, the police will come and take a report. If somebody's intoxicated, they'll come and take a report. If there's a hit and run, the police will come and take a report. But if you just have a fender bender and none of those things happen, the police will not come. And I go there and she says, I don't want any uh, rent-a-cop uh, handling this. I'm, a, I'm an employee of the federal government. I work for EEOC. And that is a government car. And I want the police to come. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but the police, you know, don't respond on accidents on private property. And then she went, I said, you know, the, the police will respond if it's, you know, but they don't. She says, I am a federal employee. I, this is a federal government car. And I, you know, and I said, ma'am, I'll call the police for you, but they will not respond. So I, uh, took her in, stepped inside where there was a phone. We didn't have cell phones then in those days. And then, of course, I was crossing my fingers that the police dispatcher or whatever wouldn't um, 
because sometimes, you know, they things that come up, I never had to come up where they would do, you know, but I was thinking, I hope this dispatcher doesn't say, well, okay, we'll send an officer or whatever. So anyway, I called, I said, I have a lady here, you know, this is security at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, and uh, been a minor accident here, nobody injured, uh, and I've told this lady here, she's a federal government employee, and the car is a federal government in car, and I explained to her if the federal government wanted to send, you know, somebody to investigate, they could, but the KCPD does not respond. And I said, uh, I'll put her on the phone with you now. And this is so-and-so, and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the dispatcher said, sorry, we do not send, you know. So I took the report. <laughs> and Now, I didn't, well, anyway, I had a, I was late for a class that I was taking there at the hospital, and the director of personnel was teaching that part of it. I took numerous courses when I was there, participatory management, motivational dynamics, or whatever. I forget which one this was, but I uh, I went and uh, went in, and there were, everybody else was nursing supervisors and me. And uh, so I went in, and I said, sorry, Mr. Johnson, uh, I got tied up with a wildcat out there. She she was really hostile. I said, she works for the federal government. She had a little accident. And he said, oh, that was so-and-so. And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, man, yeah, she is, she's something else. So if I'd have gone to the EOC, she probably would have come out, you know, and uh, taken them on. And I'd heard of a couple of things where, uh, like the one I remember is there was a big black young employee who worked in the housekeeping department. She was really big. I'm not saying, you know, she was just a big, could have been like a old day country, you know, uh, woman that worked out in the country, you know, taking, doing the, working out in the field or something or other. And she was loud and just, I don't know, she was just, I mean, you noticed her. She, and she got fired. And I forget what it was for, but the EEOC lady, and I think this was the one that came out. The EEOC lady came out and, you know, why was so-and-so fired? Well, she was fired because of the following reasons or whatever. Okay, well is this documented, you know, in the in the chart, you know, the employment thing. And it was like, well, uh, to, to the, here's a couple, you know, that, you know, but that not, you know, the, the, it was kind of, you know. And the EEOC lady said, well, tell you what I'm going to do. You're going to have to produce all the records for all of, and I think it was just for that department, which is a large department, housekeeping department, you're going to have to, and if I see anybody else in there who had this type of stuff, you know, about them, and they weren't fired, and they were white, and so they they took her back, they took the, and then she was gone later on, because then I'm sure what they did is, you know, like I did, you know, a, you know, verbal warning, which I also wrote down, you know, so that I knew when I gave the verbal, you know, and then depending on what it was, you know, a written warning, a another written warning, and then bang, you know, you were gone or whatever. But you could be gone quicker than that had a, uh, black, guy who hired in and we had two weapons there that could be used like once or twice I forgot to bring my weapon and so they were there and anybody could use them but nobody used, we all had our own weapons and uh, anyway he hired in and like his first day he shows what well, had to be the second day I guess so, in the first day, they said, okay, there's a weapon here you can use. 
And, of course, he was commissioned and stuff already, or we wouldn't have given him the gun. But um, they explained to him, now, you can't take the gun home with you. You know, you have to lock it up here. You can't take it home. It's a hospital gun. And so I come into work the next day. I was a day shift supervisor. And they said he took the gun home. And so then I asked him about it. You have to keep in mind, I knew that the guys on the second shift were racist. Anyway, I asked, I asked him and he said, no, I, I came in and I picked it up here, you know, came up and got it. And so I said, okay, well, just remember, you know, that you can't take the weapon home. It has to be locked up here. Your own weapon, of course, you know, you fine. But the hospital gun have to stay here. And so the next morning I came into work um, a little bit earlier than normal. And I waited down by the time clock. And uh, he came in from the park. He parked his came in, you know, he parked his car outside, came in to punch in, and he had the gun, hospital gun. So I fired him right on the spot. So uh, what I was talking about was accidental discharges. That was it. Because of this, I don't think it's a good idea to... Uh, if you want to have security, that's fine. I mean, there's what kind of security should you have? What sort of training should they have? What sort of certification should they have? All, all that type of stuff. You want to use off-duty police officers. Uh, you need to know the pros and cons of those. Take those things into consideration. Off-duty law enforcement officers. I've got some that watch my videos. They're not going to like this, but uh, generally, <laughs> they're not good. Um, because they have full-time jobs, and they're law enforcement officers. You know, and they don't like the idea of doing, they like the money, but they don't like the idea of doing security, you know. They're law enforcement officers, you know. They make arrest. They, they, so when they, they're not generally, you know, but there'll be ways to handle that, make sure that whether well, you can try to handle it, but. I worked at, well, that was Trinity Lutheran Hospital that I'm talking about. Trinity Lutheran Hospital. There's a, you know, the hospital, parking lot, street, St. Mary's Hospital. Street that separates them. Trinity Lutheran Hospital, 350-bed hospital. St. Mary's Hospital, 350-bed hospital. Trinity Lutheran Hospital, in-house security. St. Mary's Hospital has a director of security who is a police officer. I, don't, I guess he was retired. He was the director of security. But all the people, all the officers who work there are Kansas City, Missouri police officers who are, uh, they can pick out, you know, hey, I want to work there. I can work it into my schedule or whatever. And Trinity Lutheran Hospital, uh, larcenies, thefts, uh, one month. Trinity Lutheran Hospital, 10. St. Mary's Hospital, 40. Uh, Trinity Lutheran Hospital, we did, you know, uh, we did everything. I had to go to St. Mary's a few times, go down to St. Mary's, uh, because we shared, instead of trying to run hospital, instead of what well, was required, it was an agency, federal agency. Not every hospital could have a CT scanner. Not every hospital could have, you know, because what's the point in having one of their block away there, you know, stuff like that. So I have a few times I had to go down to St. Mary's. And I go down, walk in, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, off, or police officer working off duty, uh, attractive 
girl at the information desk. I walk in the front, you know, go in the front lobby at night. And uh, that's when I was working supervisor on the second shift. And the police officer has his back to me. He can't see me. He doesn't see me coming in because he's talking to the sweet young thing behind the counter. Uh, anyway, I go up to him and I ask him, uh, where is uh, such and such? At the hospital that I work at, I know where everything is. I can tell you inside of every office if there's a closet and what's in the closet. I go and ask him, you know, where's uh, whatever it is, uh, biomed department, uh, radiology or whatever. He doesn't know. The sweet young thing behind the counter, you know, tells me for him. Uh, eventually, St. Mary's Hospital had, on nights had to hire a security officer because the off-duty Kansas City, Missouri police officer who was working there, people would, you know, visitors would say, uh, officer, would you mind walking me to my car? Or it'd be a nurse that got off duty or something like that. Uh, would you walk me to my car? No, you don't need, it's safe out there, just go ahead. It, there's lights in the parking lot or whatever. So the hospital had to hire, you know. So there's, a, I worked at Menorah Hospital. Um, that was a, part-time job in addition to working full-time hospital security. I did that for a year to make money to pay back taxes. Um, so I was in dispatch. We switched off. On midnights at Menorah, we had supposed to have three officers, but if somebody didn't show up because they were sick or whatever, then we worked with two officers. That was not good. That was a bad, bad neighborhood. Um, so I was in dis, I was in dispatch. We traded off, you know, I was in dispatch and, uh, get a call comes in and a guy says, uh, you tell your Jew buddies that they better stop renting to these niggers over here on such and such a street or uh, we're going to set your, I forget, I forget exactly what the threat was. We're going to, we're going to set your place on fire or I didn't say shoot. We're going to set your place on fire or something like that. And of course I tried to get some, but you know, then they hung up. So then I wrote it up. And then I called the house supervisor, not security supervisor, but the RN who was in charge of the hospital at night and informed, gave her a copy of it and informed her. And I went home. So then I was off for a week because I only worked there, I think, two days a week or whatever. And so in that, that morning then, um, when it, administrative people came in. They put security on 12 hour shifts, no days off, no holidays. And they employed, I'm not sure if they did it on a day shift police off. But anyway, they hired off duty security. I know they hired them for the nights, uh, an off duty officer, because when I came back, the guys came in and they had, and the hospital had, probably shouldn't say this, but then they'd gone back to, you know, regular hours and they had let the police officers go. But the guy said, well, this Kansas City, Missouri police officer, he we had the same one every night. And uh, he would come in and with a red pillow and then he would take... Uh, now, I can't remember, it's been so long. Can't remember if he used his own car, but he drove up to like level five of the garage and went to sleep in his car, in the car. And the reason level five was in the morning, and when the day shift came in, they started on level five. They, they couldn't park on the employees on the lower levels of the garage. 
they had to start in level five, and that's what he did every night. He brought his wet red pillow in, went to sleep, and that's the same thing I saw every you know everywhere. So, uh, so I'm not sure, you know, school security. Um, I'm not sure if if you should use contract security. No, you shouldn't use contract security. I don't know, except uh, teachers should not be armed. Um, you know, right after there was a shooting, and that was in Florida also, or I believe, back a few years ago, and they increased security, or was it in Texas? Can't remember. So, a school. There was two things in the news right after that. A officer who was, I think, retired, but still, I guess, commissioned, and he'd been a sheriff of the county, or something like that. He was a wasn't a rank and file, and he wasn't a new. Uh, he was working school security, and uh, he went to go to the bathroom and took his weapon out of his holster and put it someplace. And then when he was done doing number two, I guess, hopefully he washed his hands, but uh, he didn't uh, remember to take his weapon with him. And... Uh, Somebody found the weapon. And there was another incident uh, like that also that that happened almost immediately after this when there was this talk of a while back uh, about that. So, yeah, teachers should not be armed. Uh, they're going to accidentally have the, the weapon available. Somebody, you know, I mean, we had... Uh, holsters. Well, I told you about the one, you know, a long time. First off, I worked at where I forgot to put the strap over it. But then after that, uh, we had holsters where they were supposed to be more secure. Although when we did our training, uh, office or weapons, what was it called? Anyway, we had to have training each year, revolver retention or whatever. So we had to train, you know, how to, if somebody tries to take our weapon, what do we, you know, how do we handle that situation? Uh, and then also we had to have holsters that had a certain level of protection, which is, you know, a certain way to, in order, if, you, if, if somebody just grabs your weapon, and tries to pull it up or tries to pull it back or something, it's going to, uh, they're not going to get it out. But you know, and you we have to be trained. You know, you can't just purchase a weapon or the holster and uh, put it on and then you go out and then you need to get it out because when we were firing at the range, one of the, you know, we had to qualify, but then there was also training that we had where uh, we had to be able to pull the weapon out and f fire, you know, quickly. We had to get that. We were timed, on, which I was kind of worried about uh, when we started doing that because of the danger somebody might fucking shoot their toe off or something. But we had to, you know, so, I mean, a teacher decides for some reason put their gun someplace and it's not secure, uh, weapon gets dropped somehow, you know, I mean, there's a lot to that and just the simplistic idea that you're going to, uh, you know, if you're a teacher, you have a lot to learn, lesson plans and you need to do, you know, and if you are a police officer or a security officer, you know, whatever it is, there's things that you need to know and you need to train and you need to work with or whatever. And uh, 
security at one hospital that I worked at. It was I, I objected to it, but we took over snow removal, so we had to plow snow. We had to, you know, decide whether to use sand or salt. We had to, you know, uh, we were the. And that was it. We picked up patient valuables, and there's things you have to know about, you know, that. Um, as an example, and this is the only thing I can think of off the top, you know, when somebody, we had a lady that lived in a bad area of town. She came to the hospital, and she had a box that was filled with gold jewelry. So, uh, anyway, actually with that, since I was a supervisor or whatever, I just told the officer, you know, no, we're not going to open that box up and go through there and itemize every piece or whatever. I said, Sec make sure it's secured, which she'd already taped it up. Make sure it's secured, and we'll give her a receipt for one box contents unknown. But when you got something, you know, somebody, I remember, can't remember what it seemed to me like it was a woman. I think it was. And she said, uh, this ring here is, I don't know what she, you know, I don't think about jewelry, you know. I don't know if she said it was 12 carat or 18 carats. I don't know which is better, you know. You know, gold. And the diamond is a such and such type cut diamond or whatever. And I, I said, no. I said, I'll, you know, I will uh, put down yellow metal color and... Uh, you know, with the stone or whatever. I said, I'm not a jeweler. I can't say it's gold. And I can't say that's a diamond. And I can't say it's such and such a cut or whatever. She actually kept it. You know, she said, okay, well, I'm not going to give it to you. I said, fine, you know. Uh, you know, charted on the chart, you know, the person was told they shouldn't have it here at the hospital, blah, 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 blah. And uh person was told they should have family members or somebody take it home. And that if something happened to it, it was not your hospital's response, you know, responsibility. But, I mean, there's, just for security, being a security officer someplace, now there's more to learn, If different, you know, there'll be more to learn being a hospital security officer if you're in-house security. If you're a contract security, then... That's probably going to be different because you're just going to, uh, I hate to think of the contract security at a hospital, but that's what I ran into. I was in charge of at this one hospital, uh, you know, I wasn't, and I was for the contract company, I was the person in charge of that, but, um, but there would be a lot for somebody who's working security at a, I have a feeling they don't, you know, go into that. I got, you know, if somebody's a, but there would be a lot to know what, you know, what, what are the, the legal rules with, you know, dealing with, you know, juveniles, uh, you know, what, what can you and can't you do? And, uh, you know, when does, which all the time would be, you know, you know, how to, when do parents need to be notified, which I'm sure is basically right away, you know what I mean? Not when there's a shooting, you know, well, when there's a shooting, but, you know, if you're dealing with a kid, you know, can you, uh, when do there, you know, so there'd be a lot to know and just to think that you could just hire somebody in off the street and arm them, even if you go through, and going through the uh, concealed weapons permit thing, there's a, some state someplace where you don't even have to attend a training class or a certification. We, I think you do it online, answer some questions online, but you don't have to... Uh, and because that 